This is The Reason Interview with Nick Gillespie. My guest today is the Libertarian Party candidate for president, Chase Oliver, who wants to phase out Social Security and Medicare for younger Americans, create a 21st century version of Ellis Island, and get the government completely out of bedrooms and boardrooms. A longtime anti-war activist, he also wants to bring American troops home and slash the Pentagon's budget. But despite such ultra-libertarian positions, a number of high-profile Libertarian Party figures and state parties have declined to endorse him because he's not part of the group's Mises Caucus, and he believes that the non-surgical transitioning of minors should be decided by doctors, parents, and kids without the state intervening. I talked with Chase about his opposition to mask and vaccine mandates, which has often been totally misrepresented by his critics, how he first encountered the Libertarian Party at a gay pride event, and whether he's encountered homophobia among the LP faithful, and why he thinks millennials and Zoomers are particularly ready to listen to libertarian ideas after constantly being lied to by boomers like Donald Trump, Kamala Harris, and RFK Jr. Here is The Reason Interview with Chase Oliver. Chase Oliver, the 2024 Libertarian Party presidential candidate. Thanks for talking to The Reason Interview. Yeah, thank you for having me. I look forward to speaking with you and your audience. Okay, so let's, uh, I want to start with a replay that of a question that you've been asked, you know, come on, Chase, you're a third party candidate, gun to the head, Kamala Harris or Donald Trump? What yeah, the gun, the gun would go off. Uh, my my answer has not changed just because the Democrats have changed their nominee. Uh, I, I wasn't impressed with Kamala Harris as a VP candidate. She's not really impressing me as a presidential candidate. Um, well, let's uh, talk about your, uh, I want we will uh, talk about Kamala Harris and the Democratic platform, as well as Donald Trump and the Republican. But let's start with you. What's your vision for America? Why, you know, lay out the uh, Chase Oliver presidential platform. Well, you know, what I want to see is an America that actually looks towards the future, not just towards the next two years, the next congressional uh, election. I want to be looking long term at how can we make our economy more secure um, how can we better serve the needs of our voters and how can we increase the freedom of each and every individual to seek, uh, you know, their American dream and what they want to do in their lives. And so that starts with getting our economy under control. If okay, I, what, what does that mean? Um, because you're a libertarian, right? So you don't want to control the economy. Yeah, by getting the economy under control, I mean relinquishing the control of the U.S. government and returning that control back to the free market and to entrepreneurs. Um, and then also, of course, cutting our government down to size to where we're not running trillion dollar budgets ever, or deficits every year. Uh, so we're actually, you know, not creating wealth out of nowhere, which devalues everyone's dollar. Oh, not wealth, but you're creating dollars rather. You're not creating anything. So the feds spend, you know, over six trillion dollars a year now for the past couple of years. It looks like that, you know, that is kind of the ratchet. Uh, you know, we're not going to get below that anytime soon based on, you know, recent uh, appearances. What should the uh, federal government be spending per year and where should the cuts come from? Well, the government should be uh, spending far less than it take, you know, it's taking in right now. Like right now, we need to get ourselves at least to a balanced budget. And that involves cutting a lot of the third rails of American politics. And maybe it's because I'm under the age of 40 and I'm not afraid to actually address issues that are going to hit us in the long term. But we have to cut entitlements. We have to get Social Security off of uh you know, uh, out of insolvency and basically return that wealth back to individuals instead of relying on the Ponzi scheme of Social Security. It involves us untangling the knot that is government involvement in our healthcare system, including Medicare and Medicaid, and uh, phasing those systems out over time. So that way uh, we can return back to normal market practices with healthcare. Um, but yeah, we're talking major cuts. Like, I mean, I would a 50% cut to the Pentagon, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, would still have us militarily capable of defending ourselves and warding off any invasion that we could ever have. Uh, but it would take an awful lot of the bloat, the bureaucratic mess and the red tape out of the Pentagon. Uh, and so look for cuts like into, into that realm in terms of every major department, if not outright elimination of many of those departments. Uh, the biggest one, of course, being the Department of Education is the one uh, Americans are most concerned about. So 
let's talk about Social Security, uh, you know, either uh, getting rid of it or taking it off the federal budget or making it so actually self-sustaining. You know, wasn't that long ago when George W. Bush was reelected in 2004, one of the two things that he vowed to do, he said, I have a lot of I've amassed a lot of political capital and I'm going to use it. One of the first things he tried to do after that was to reform Social Security and open it up to you know market forces and things like that. Talk about how you would actually take Social Security from being one of the largest items in the federal budget, something that is loved by everybody, young and old. And you know how do you do it? And who is the constituency for getting rid of Social Security? Well, first, all of this comes with the we have to recognize that Social Security is insolvent. That by the time a worker my age, who's you know I'm about to be 39 years old, so if you're in my age range, you're going to keep paying into Social Security and not have benefits. Or we can reform the system to have you, you know, uh, you know, not reform the system, but get rid of the system overall uh, to where you're no longer paying your employee contribution and you need to contribute that to a mutual fund or a retirement mm -hmm. account on your own, which will have better return on your investment anyways. I mean, you could put your money into the S&P 500 and get a better return than you get from Social Security. But then the question is, is what do we do about people who are on Social Security right now? People like my parents or people's parents or grandparents. Uh, you keep the system solvent long enough for that last generation to retire. And you do that by keeping the employer contribution long enough to hold the system in, you know, solvent long enough for that last generation to retire. But once they retire, we send down the system entirely. We remove the system from our lives and return that back to individuals being able to save for themselves and their families. Uh, and, you know, at the community level, if there's need for people to, uh, you know, who are in need, who are, uh, you know, there, that's why we have mutual and direct aid organizations and charity to be able to help for those people. But the federal government gets out of that kind of helping the poor. Yes, the federal government shouldn't be our retirement planner. They shouldn't be somebody who uh, squirrels away our money. And of course, they don't ever squirrel it away. They actually depleted the Social Security Trust Fund multiple times. All that's left in that trust fund is IOUs and deficit and debt spending. How is this playing yeah. with, with younger people? Because, you know, as I mentioned, George W. Bush, who's a boomer, in 2004, he was saying, you know, we got to change the system. It's screwed up. We got to let people get out of it somehow or, or let them make more money. Um, that is no longer on the table politically. Uh, Donald Trump and Kamala Harris, Republicans and Democrats, never talk about Social Security reform. Are, are you, is that landing with people uh, your age and younger? Or are they also kind of like, hey, I don't want, I don't want my parents to go hungry or grandparents. And I also don't want to be paying for that. I don't want them to move in with me, assuming I eventually inherit their house, blah, 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 or something like that. Yeah. So this is why what we want to see is an order to transition away from the program. Like I said, I don't want my parents and grandparents, you know, and your grandparents to have to go off of uh, people's, uh, you know, what they've been dependent on, what they've paid into their entire life. But younger workers like myself do recognize the need that they're not going to have Social Security, whether they pay into it or not. And so offering them the alternative of not having to pay into the system and investing in their own retirement is very attractive certainly for millennials who they can do the math. They can see that this is not going to be something that's going to be solvent by the time they're needing it. And so, yeah, we want to keep it solvent long enough for those in need, our parents and grandparents. But for our generation, we just recognize we're going to have to work harder because our the past generations have already debt spent us into a mm -hmm. hole that we're going to have to dig ourselves out of. And millennials recognize this. Maybe that's why we're a pessimistic generation sometimes, uh, but it's well earned. Talk about uh, Medicare and Medicaid. These are the major, you know, Medicare is fully funded by the federal government. Medicare, uh, Medicaid rather, which goes to the states and, and supports people at or near the uh, poverty level, although that's been expanded over time. Um, how, do you, how do you unwind that? Because this is also something when she was running for president in 2020, uh, Kamala Harris said she favored Medicare for all, which is a big uh, you know, plan that Bernie Sanders and uh, many people on the left end of the political spectrum in the Democratic Party push. Uh, when Donald Trump, he was elected promising that he was going to repeal and replace Obamacare, he did nothing of the sort. And the Republicans, you know, they caught the car and they did nothing. Um, ultimately, they pulled away the individual, the tax or a fine for the individual mandate, but they didn't reform anything. How do you take us out of Medicare spending and Medicaid spending. Well, it, you know, like I said, it's like it is like a rope that has a million knots to it. So much of it is just the bureaucracy and the red tape. And you have to have a major reform bill that basically streamlines as much of that as possible, if not outright eliminating it. Again, I would like to sundown Medicare 
overall in, in the long run, because if you see how much government has invested itself in the healthcare marketplace, that just shows you how much faster healthcare has risen faster than inflation than other uh, industries. Education is much the same way. And so seeing this, we recognize that uh, the first thing we have to do is target areas where uh, removing the regulatory framework actually lowers costs. First thing you want to be able to do is, you know, uh, in addition to Medicare and Medicaid and eliminating those programs off the federal budget, uh, you want to add market practices to the healthcare marketplace overall, like buying health insurance across state lines, which is something Republicans yeah. promise to do every two years, every four years, they never get that done. Uh, you want to remove patent evergreening from drugs uh, that have allowed things like insulin to remain ex super expensive. You know, Democrats run on, I made insulin cheap uh, for Medicare patients. Well, they didn't. They made it the cost at the end run, but now mm -hmm. that total cost burden is still spread across the entire program. So if you were to remove patent evergreening, you would actually lower the cost of drugs which would lower the cost of some of this program. But overall, it's like trying to bail out of a ship that's sinking. Like yeah. there's just not enough buckets. You eventually have to let the ship of Medicare sink. We have to recognize that over time, this is driving up the cost of healthcare. And Medicare for all is loss of innovation for all, loss of choice for all, loss of marketplace practices for all. And that is a bad outcome. We do not want that. If you want to see what that has done, go to Canada where you have to wait months to get proper healthcare screenings for things like cancer and proper procedures that take you from having something that's quite easily to handle here in the United States to something that could possibly become terminal in Canada. Same with the United Kingdom. They are stressed to the brink. We do not need those kinds of practices here in the United States. We need to return ourselves to free market practices. Uh, but again, that's not something that can just be easily done. That is going to be a bill that is going to be many hundreds or if not thousands of pages because we didn't get here with a single page bill that created Medicare. Uh, and so a lot of that's going to have to be done at like the legalese policy level. Um, but eventually, I would like to see us where we have no Medicare at all. So uh, another thing that uh, George W. Bush, and it's kind of interesting, I, you know, I wasn't expecting to uh, think about it in these terms, but the the president, the Republican incumbent Republican president in 2004, uh, when he won re-election pretty easily against John Kerry, said, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to privatize part of Social Security or reform it. And I'm also going to do comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, neither of these are on the table. You have a, uh, a, a pretty memorable phrasing for what you want to see in immigration policy. Can you outline that for me? Yeah. So what I call my immigration policy is a 21st century Ellis Island. Uh, the reason being because the, that was the last time we had the great migration wave into this country. One in four Americans can trace their heritage back to Ellis Island. And so uh, I want to bring that back into the minds of Americans when they think about immigration today. What we need to do is practice what Ellis Island did, but in the 21st century. So come through a port of entry, declare who you are, get a quick background check, and then come in this country with legal status to work if you're a migrant worker. This does several things. One, it prevents wages from being dri driven down from American workers because the reason why immigrant labor drives down, uh, not just because of market practices, but because they're exploited for their wages. You know, they, they have to accept less payment for fear of deportation. Now you'll have workers competing on a level playing field. Two, this is safer for our communities because right now, if you're an immigrant uh, and you see a crime occurring, you might not want to go to the police and report that for fear of putting your name on an official document and having that traced back to you and eventually being found to be here without documentation or legal status. And three, it actually allows our law enforcement to laser focus on the real crimes going on on our southern border. Things like human trafficking for the purposes of labor or sexual exploitation, or for people who fraud people by taking fentanyl and pressing them to look like Xanax pills. That's fraud. I'm a free, you know, I'm a, I'm a libertarian. Yeah. I want to legalize all drugs, but to, to fraud somebody and cause overdoses is, is a real crime as well. And so if people are, are who want to just come here to work can legally pass the report of entry, we can really focus on those who are wanting to do harm in the so United there's, States. There's no limit on the number of people who could come into the country at a, you know, in a given year, as long as they pass a kind of like medical check and a, and a criminal background check. Yeah, exactly. The market can determine exactly how many jobs we need to have, you mm -hmm. know, the labor pool we need to have. Um, and I think we as libertarians who have always supported the free market re need to recognize that labor is also a marketplace and there is a supply and demand and that will work itself out accordingly. Another great thing about the Ellis Island model is you can come here for seasonal employment. If you're an agricultural worker, for instance, you can come here during planting and harvesting. And then once the harvesting season is over, you take your money back south of the border to see your family again and where your money is going to go much further. 
do you worry, uh, or let me ask, how do, how do you respond to people who say, you know what, that's insanity. A country without borders is not a country. And also then you're not assimilating people. You know, that the fact is, is that from 1880 to about 1924, when the, uh, the European border or, you know, access to America for Europeans was shut down, uh, there was brutal, brutally enforced legal and especially cultural assimilation. None of that is happening now. So what you're talking about is essentially surrendering to, you know, third world people, people from the developing world coming here and bringing their terrible politics to the United States. Yeah, um, I, 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 the first thing I would say is um, I want to push back on that argument that people don't assimilate. I think much of the United States culture, if you look at like Tex-Mex culture, uh, south, you know, in, in that region of the country, much of that is cultural assimilation that actually happened the other way. When Texas became a state, it was actually majority, you know, people who were citizens of Mexico. Uh, mm -hmm. And so there's already been cultural assimilation happening there. Uh, I don't fear people who want to come here. In fact, much of what makes America great is that we actually assimilate cultures from outside of our own. We Americanize it, and that allows us to export our values more easily around the world. Um, it's one of the things I actually celebrate about America. What do you uh, think, though? I mean, it's clear we're in a moment where people on the right and the left seem much more wary of immigration uh, you know, than in the past, I think, uh, you know, em immigration is near the top of a lot of people's uh, concerns in, you know, polls these days. What explains the, you know, even even as we all say, oh, well, you know, I'm this or that kind of American and I trace my heritage through Ellis Island, et cetera. Um, you know, like we got we need a pause. So like, why are people down on immigrants? Well, I think part of that to be frank, is a masterful marketing on the part of conservative media to scare people into feeling like we're in some sort of immigrant crime wave. When if you actually just look at crime statistics, we're near historic lows in terms of crime. We had an uptick during the beginning of COVID because, of course, anytime there's economic insecurity, you're going to see an uptick in crime. Uh, but now that we have kind of moved past the pandemic era, um, you're seeing crime returning back to historic lows. But yet we see the stories of immigrants who are killing or hurting people on the news every night. Mm -hmm. This is done for a reason. This is done because it generates electoral fodder. It creates a wedge politic. Um, and if you're, you know, I, I encourage people who are skeptics, many libertarians are, to really look at the numbers, to really look at the statistics here and not be fooled by what they see on the media, whether that's the, you know, whether that's the 10 o'clock news or whether that's a podcast that isn't really looking into the data. Uh, really do that work for yourself. And what you'll see is, is you're seeing scaremongering happening here. You know, immigrants do, some immigrants do commit crime, but, you know, they commit crime at a lower rate than native born people. Uh, uh, but then people say, yeah, but like illegals, you know, there should be zero crime by, by illegals. There should be zero illegal immigration into the country. How do you respond to that kind of argument? Well, we've just never lived in a world where that's the case. So we can we can live in a fantasy world or we can live in the real world where people are still going to come here and we can either properly process them or continue to create a shadow economy. How do you, that how, do you how do you secure the border? Because would you agree that there is chaos, uh, you know, at the border of Mexico, you know, between Mexico and the U.S. that, you know, there's so many people they're not being processed properly or they're being you know kicked out and then they come back in, et cetera. How do, how do you how do you make that less uh, chaotic? Well, I think by streamlining the process, I think government itself is what makes the immigration process so chaotic. If you look at like all the red tape and all the steps you have to take to properly be processed through or to become a citizen, even uh, in the long run, um, it's a long, complicated process. If you streamline a process, more people will go through it. If you make it more easy to be, you know, if you, it's more easily accessible, less expensive and less time consuming, people will do that as opposed to illegally coming across the border. But if we don't make that available, you know, it just time has shown and, you know, history has shown that people will yeah. continue to come here to seek a better life. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, it's frankly impossible. By the way, the J.D. Vance is the world who want to deport everybody. These mass deportation ideas, uh, A, would just add trillions to the budget and would be a security nightmare, like a privacy nightmare that we would never want to see. It would make the post 9-11. Well, uh, come on, you and I and J.D. Way. Vance, we don't have to worry, right? We look pretty American, I guess. So nobody would ask us for our papers, right? Exactly. I mean, I guess that's maybe what J.D. Vance thinks. But, you know, I have many friends who are a few shades darker than I am in terms of skin color, and I wouldn't want them to have to worry about the national security state 
that would be created around a deportation model. Like, God forbid somebody loses an ID or uh, is improperly identified and then uh, has to go through that horrible process. Like, I just wouldn't want to see uh, our world devolve into something like that. It's very un-American. How would you have responded to COVID? You know, this is something that, you know, it happened while Donald Trump was president. And he was the guy who said, hey, two weeks to flatten the curve. Let's lock it down for a little bit, but it'll be open by, you know, Easter of 2020. Uh, then Joe Biden came in and, uh, you know, saw things through. How would you have responded to COVID uh, differently or, or possibly in the same way that uh, Trump and Biden did? Well, I think one of the major problems they uh, put in place is both mandatorily locking down things uh, as well as trying to mandate the health behavior of people. This created a natural skepticism and distrust of government, certainly. Uh, what we should have done is been advising people as best we can from, you know, the, the government does have you know quite a bit of uh, logistical capability to be able to study these things and determine, you know, and to advise. But you should never require people to take your advice. I think when you do that, you're acting in bad faith. And so much of what was done in the initial, uh, also in the initial run, the FDA just completely was a shit show, to be frank. Like uh, they completely failed on everything from getting testing going quickly to finding the best practices to mitigate these kinds of things. Uh, you know, at every level, there was just kind of uh, bureaucratic failure. Um, and that's something that should be studied for generations to come to just under understand how badly government operates in an emergency. <laughs> I Did think they do something... anything right? I mean, is something like Operation Warp Speed, do you think that was uh, successful? Well, I think broadly speaking, we need to deregulate much of what we do to put drugs in the marketplace. In general, it shouldn't have to require an emergency order to streamline the process of bringing new drugs to market. Um, so, you know, not all of that is uh, not all of that is bad, the idea that we can more quickly get drugs to market. But I think the way that the vaccine was rolled out, the way it was marketed to the American people, uh, the fact that it was sold as this sort of like wonder vaccine that you'll, you'll be completely immune from COVID completely. And then as that was shown not to be the case, of course, more skepticism, more distrust yeah. of government. And this is, a, this is what happens when government over promises and under delivers, which is what they always do. Uh, and yeah, so I would like to see Frankly, not having an FDA, I would prefer to put safety and efficacy of drugs into the private marketplace. Uh, but absent that, streamline it as much as possible. Make sure the main focus is on safety, uh, that it's not going to kill somebody, and then allow people to make their own decisions for their own drugs, what they want to do. You are by uh, orders of magnitude, or at least at li uh, you know at least a couple of decades, uh, the youngest presidential candidate among people that are going to have ballot access in enough states to you know, actually, uh, you know, potentially win enough votes in the Electoral College. You said you're 39, right? Or about to turn 39? 39 in just a couple of weeks, yeah. Okay, so, uh, you know, Kamala Harris uh, shaved 20 years uh, or so off of the uh, Democratic uh, ticket. Donald Trump is in his late 70s. Uh, RFK Jr., who was looking like the spring chicken, is 70. Is there something specific that you want to say to people your age and younger about politics and how that intersects with a libertarian view of the world? Yeah, what I would like to say to younger voters is if you've recognized that we've lost more and more of our freedom, that we've become more polarized and more divided, much of that has to do with the power of incumbency and the fact that people who are in power today, many of them were in power 20 years ago when I was 18 years old. Uh, and that is a shame. Uh, and that is a result of a two-party system that has been built up seeking to divide people that actually functions and flourishes off of division. And I think that younger voters need to reject this. One of the reasons why I'm happy to be a millennial voice is because I'm somebody who's actually had to live in the economy that these 70 and 80 year olds have been creating for me for the last 20 years, uh, these conditions that the government has put in place for us. And so I think it's really important as a libertarian to be a younger voice and to be a newer voice that can reject the politics of old in favor of something that's positive that we can seek to look for and, and be positive about growing into over the next 30 or 40 years. Um, I certainly want to vote for people and not just against the terrible two-party system. Um, and, and I think younger voters are ready to have more options. Let's, uh, before we go back to more positive stuff about you and your platform, let's talk, let's go negative here a little bit. What is terrible or what is wrong with Kamala Harris and the Democratic Party ticket, whoever her VP ends up being, you know, that it's no better than what Joe Biden was offering? What's your case against 
Harris and the Democrats? Well, my case against Harris personally is um, just much of a record, both as a DA in San Francisco, her time as AG in California, and her just very lackluster time as a senator before becoming vice president. Uh, If you look at her time as DA in San Francisco, she put a lot of good people in jail for uh, the crime of consuming cannabis, while she even admitted on The Breakfast Club that she was a mm-hmm. user of cannabis. Uh, she laughed about wanting to jail truant par- or parents of truant students as if jailing the parents of kids who are skipping school is going to make their education outcomes better. Uh, she was just generally uncaring when it came to uh, being the AG and keeping people in prison past their sentences so they could maintain volunteer firefighters with the prison firefighters. Uh, mm-hmm. There's evidence that she kept evidence past uh, that would have kept people out of jail. Like there's a lot of scummy things she's done in her record that just make her as not fitting to be president. Um, and then just generally the Democratic Party is a party that is a big spending party that every problem they have, there needs to be a government solution. Um, I think they exacerbate a lot of the uh, is- social issues that we're seeing in a way that's not productive. Uh, for me, it is uh, about. Can my you uh, talk a bit about that? Like, what what do you mean? Um, they seem to be pretty good on, um, you know, trying to maintain abortion rights, for instance, or uh, you know, medical autonomy, uh, at least when it comes to reproductive control. Is that is is that a bad thing? No, that's actually a good thing. I'm pro-choice. So that's actually one, I'll say one nice thing about either of my opponents. That's one thing that I agree with Kamala Harris on. She is pro-choice. I am pro-choice. I think most of America is pro-choice. But I think one area of difference between me and say the Democrats is I support the Hyde Amendment. I don't think taxpayer money should be going to fund abortion because I do think it's a very moral uh, gray area for many people. It's an area where there's a lot of uh, individual decision making that needs to be happening. And I don't want to take people's taxpayer money to fund abortion if they're you know, uh, ardently pro-life. Is that also uh, the case if they are ardently uh, anti-transitioning their children or anti-hair lip? I mean, why, why should abortion, if abortion is legal and just, why shouldn't the government fund it if it's funding medical treatments? Well, I don't want the government to be funding medical treatments uh, overall. Like so one of the things I'll say is, is, you know, as a libertarian, it should surprise nobody when I say the government should not fund this. Right. Uh, but I do think in particular, yeah, except for uh, other libertarians who will be like, you're not saying it loud enough. Yeah, well, that's true. You know, there's that no true Scotsman, right? But uh, I, I shot it loud and clear that the government yeah. shouldn't fund hardly anything, but uh, an abortion should be no different. Um, what else about the, you know, the under Joe Biden, the uh, the government grew massively. You know, part of that was COVID uh, allowed for massive spending. Donald Trump also, who had been jacking up spending before COVID, you know, then, you know, put a green light on a lot of massive expansion of government spending. Um, you know, how like are, are the Democrats like what what in the government spending or overreach is most troubling to you? Ultimately, is there a limiting principle there that you can say this is why this stuff is so bad? Well, you know, much of it is just because much of what government is doing is just what I feel is outside of what the Constitution has the federal government needing to do. Much of this is Ninth and Tenth Amendment issues when it comes to why I don't want government to be spending, even if it was even it was doing the best job possible at what its aims are, which it never does. uh, It just doesn't have that responsibility because the Constitution puts that responsibility either onto the states or onto the individuals, um, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and so. Just much of what the federal government does and what Democrats push is just. Why do you think uh, millennials and Gen Z um, have overwhelmingly they, you know, when they're asked by pollsters, they say, you know, they're nonpartisan or they're less partisan than um, Gen Xers or boomers. Uh, but they always vote Democratic overwhelmingly, it seems. Uh, you know, what what explains that? And how does a libertarian reach young people who might be skeptical of old people. Certainly, you know, there's a lot of, okay, boomer, boomer eliminationism, all of that kind of stuff. But at the same time, you know, they end up voting for a uh, big government in a way that makes boomers like me, uh, you know, cringe a little bit. Yeah, I think part of what that is, is us just having to, A, let voters recognize that they have more than two choices. Like they feel like it's futile. Of course, a lot of kids, a lot of younger people, I say kids, I'm a millennial, but a lot of millennial and Gen Zers don't even vote because they just feel like it's a completely worthless proposition to even get out and vote. Uh, and so we have to show them that there are more choices in the ballot. 
uh, one of the things that I encourage them to recognize is that if you're voting within the two-party system, you're not making it hurt for the Democrats or Republicans. You're not making them have to respond to you. And so if you've noticed, you're going to get lesser and lesser quality of candidates. I mean, you've gotten Donald Trump three times in a row, so young people just aren't interested. But when it well, comes and we to- had Joe Biden, right? Uh, yeah. You know, a candidate so bad that they were like, okay, we're going to return this to the factory. We're taking it <laughs> off the shelf and putting it in the dumpster and back. Um, yeah. Well, let's talk about Donald Trump. What what is um, you know what what's your main case against Donald Trump and the GOP in twenty twenty four? Well, you know, where as I find the Democrats to be kind of the stale politics of old and just kind of continuing the bad politics that I've seen my entire life. Uh, Donald Trump represents a market departure, but not in the direction we want to see. He is not leading towards more. Uh, libertarianism or liberalism he's leading towards more authoritarianism using the flex and the power of the of the government's muscle to you know to attack those that he feels that aren't worthy uh, what, or what's an example of that, that. if you can well just the so the way that he uh, cracks down upon immigration and the fact that even dreamers are in the uh, the target of him these are these are young people who were brought to this country through no fault of their own they've really only ever lived in the United States only known the United States uh, but much of the rhetoric that comes out of the Republican Party is very much against them and uh, they are they are much in the sights of the people who are holding those mass deportation now signs at the RNC. Yeah. What um you know what do you think of JD Vance? We uh, you know while we're speaking we don't know who Kamala Harris's VP is, but um uh you know but JD Vance was announced to uh, pretty good acclaim at the Republican National Convention. Since then, you know he's kind of been going down the tubes. But JD Vance is basically your age. Um, you know what's what's wrong with JD Vance and what does he say about? the possible future of the Republican Party. First off, I think J.D. Vance is kind of self-serving considering he called Donald Trump cultural heroin and America's Hitler, you know, those kinds of things. And so it's clear to me that he's just a standard politician that will fall right in line with Donald Trump uh, if it suits him and gives him power, which is much of what's wrong with the Republican Party. We do need more people in the Republican Party to actually challenge the illiberal notions of Donald Trump. Uh, but in general, like much of the rhetoric that has come uh, from J.D. Vance is really worrying for me because, again, when it talks about using that federal muscle, he doesn't want to eliminate the administrative state. He wants to seize it and use it for himself. You know, he wants to remove the bodily autonomy rights of everyone across the country with, with in terms of abortion. Uh, and so there's a lot of things he said in the past that are really worrying rhetorically. Uh, but just his idea that we don't need to remove the administrative state, but we should rather seize it for our own means uh, is worrisome. Yeah. Is that something though that millennials actually think i mean you know and i and i hesitate to put you on the uh the dock you know as as like the voice of millennials but why not you you're the only presidential candidate who's running who is a millennial and you know our our people in your cohort you know they've gr you've grown up you know the, all of the 21st century has just been a decline in trust and confidence in all institutions across you know in in every aspect of our lives and why wouldn't you just say, you know what, this is a shit system. Uh, I might as well take control of the institutions of power and then use them to get what I want or what I need, because it's not like the other people are going to be doing anything differently. Well, you know, as the spokesperson for all millennials, uh, mm -hmm. I'm just kidding. But, uh, you know, I, I can understand that base instinct, right? That base instinct of, well, let me just take it for myself and fix it. Uh, but what we have to understand and what we have to recognize as a generation is that much of the problems we see are caused by problems that are unfixable. The, 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 the problem themselves is the government being involved in this process and the government trying to control uh, the marketplace, trying to con control the decision making that people make, trying to control the culture. Uh, these are things I think government needs to take a step back from and allow you know, organically to happen in the free marketplace of ideas. That's its own free market. Now, that's something that has put you at odds, even with other libertarians. Um, and I, I will talk about your biography, I guess, in a second. But let's talk about your relationship with the Libertarian Party. Um, when you were when you won the nomination uh, at the Libertarian National Convention in uh, in uh, Washington, D.C., a number of high profile people uh, who were affiliated with the Mises caucus faction within the Libertarian Party said, hey, you know what, congrats on the win, but we can't support you. And among the reasons they said was that you did not support people like Ron DeSantis when he uh, mandated that businesses could not uh, could not not require vaccination papers or masking in their stores. Um, and I realize I'm already confusing myself, but essentially, 
what you were saying was that individual businesses and individual people should set their own mandates on whether or not they get vaccinated, but also if they own a business, they should be able to say to people, if you want to come in here, you got to follow my rules, which seems to me very libertarian, but that seemed to fall on deaf ears among many people in the Libertarian Party. Now, the question is, is do we trust individuals in their, to make decisions for themselves, their businesses, is, or not? That's the mm-hmm. thing. Like, I, I can say it's a, you know, it's a bad idea for somebody to do something or it's a good idea for somebody to do something, but to mandate that using the monopoly of force of government is wrong. That's central to the core of libertarianism. And we should be yeah. allowing culture to kind of push those decisions. And, you know, if you're a business that requires, say, a vaccine mandate for your workers and you lose out on good workers who don't want to get a vaccine and they end up going to another firm and producing wealth for another firm or another business, that's the nature of the free market. That's exactly what we should be wanting to see instead of government making those decisions. And Why I think do you think another- that position was so unpopular among many libertarians that they're like, oh, I can't support you? I think part of it is a reaction to the fact that the government was so heavy handed the other way in the uh, outset of the pandemic that we had a Biden government that was trying to use the power of OSHA to mandate vaccines upon workers, to mandate behavior upon businesses. And my argument is just because it was being done to you doesn't mean you should be doing it to others. Right. Uh, Two wrongs don't make a right here. We actually need to be philosophically uh, consistent and say it was wrong for the government to try to mandate behavior one way. It's wrong for the government to try to mandate behavior in the other way. We should be allowing individuals to mandate their own behavior because we as libertarians believe in the most local government, which is your self governing your ability to maintain your own behavior. Before we continue with the Reason interview with Nick Gillespie, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Students for Liberty. Are you a freedom-loving college student seeking a platform to amplify your voice? then you need to check out Students for Liberty, a global hub for liberty-loving students like you. Their ever-expanding network unites pro-liberty individuals from diverse backgrounds in over 100 countries. Their vision is a freer future, and they aim to make this vision a reality by educating, developing, and empowering their student leaders. It's important for the students who participate to not only understand the operations of Students for Liberty, but also believe in the purpose of the group and become enthusiastic agents of change in their communities. SFL students are working to hold events that will inspire others to work for liberty on campus and beyond, despite very real resistance from administrators and other students. Their alumni are working across industries, taking their ideas into think tanks and public office, and planting the seeds of liberty in their everyday lives. Empower yourself and others to champion freedom. Visit studentsforliberty.org to discover how you can join their movement and contribute to building a better future, a freer future. That's studentsforliberty.org. And now back to the Reason interview with Nick Gillespie. So another issue that seemed to really um, stick in the craw of many, you know, major libertarian figures, uh, and I'm ta- thinking of people like uh, Dave Smith and other high-profile proponents of, of the Mises Caucus, was that you say that um, questions about transitioning for children under the age of 18 should be an issue that is decided between parents, doctors, and the kids. And they say that is a mix of pedophilia and uh, and uh, child uh, disfigurement. How do you respond to that? Or, or what, are, what are they not seeing um, from a well, libertarian I, perspective? You know, first off, I think, you know, those kinds of things, talks of groomer or pedophilia, these kinds of things are, first off, it's outlandish and it actually discounts those actual instances where real grooming and, and uh, childhood sexual trauma occur. And so... Um, I think we need to recognize that this is a question of medical freedom. I'm not trying to tell one parent or one family how to raise their family or how to handle uh, maybe questions of gender dysphoria, uh, you know, how how to treat that. What I think is, is we need to leave that into the realm of parents and doctors to decide these things. Why? Because parents have unconditional love most, you know, for the most part for their kids. Like most parents would die for their kids. They would do anything to see their kids happy and healthy. And so they're going to be a great advocate when you walk into a doctor's office and you're speaking to a doctor who also has an, uh, you know, the, the uh, oath to do no harm to seek to, to help people. And so I think both of those individuals in conjunction with 
speaking to a young person are much better capable of making medical decisions than some far off bureaucrat in a state house. I think are there also any... what... yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. I, I think what we're failing sometimes to rep to realize too is is I think more people should actually speak to young people who are going through gender dysphoria and their families and recognize that much of this is, you know, it's not something that people are like, oh, I'm so excited that my kid's going through questions about gender. It's often a very stressful thing that families are going through and they need to be able to maneuver that and go through that minefield themselves and not have to have the government involved. And I speak to many libertarians who feel the exact same way because they are going through that situation right now. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do think the one area where I do create a caveat is for surgery. I think surgery should be left to adults because it's permanently changing the, the physical construct of your body. It also requires you to undergo anesthesia and have recovery times. And I think those should be reserved for adults. Um, but I'm Are there other here. limits on that? I mean, you, because you, I mean, you know, uh, teenagers get nose jobs all the time or things like that. Is there, should that also be restricted until people reach an age of legal majority? Yeah, I think most cosmetic surgeries should be absolutely limited outside of the realm of an emergency, like, right, like if you need reconstruction because you've been in a wreck and your face has been hurt, you know, harmed and you have to reconstruct the face, that's one thing. But to say, I'm 16 and I want a nose job because I think I'll look better in the prom pictures, um, I think that should be waiting until you're an adult, frankly. Uh, but I'll be consistent here. Uh, other than with religious exemption, I'm also anti-circumcision. So, like, I'm against, you know, surgical body modification under the age of 18 for just about anybody. That's going to make it hard for the uh, eighteen-year-old boys, right, who are born into the, you know, who convert later, I guess. But, yeah. um, uh, you know, what what do you think about laws that, um, you know, and, and a couple of these have come up recently, where um, at the state level or at the local level, uh, you know, laws get passed saying that schools sh uh, don't have to or uh, don't have to uh, tell parents if they are treating their kids as the opposite of their birth gender or anything like that. Is that a good idea or what's, you know, how do you feel about things like that? It is something to me that, you know, we have to understand that. I think we all recognize, I think everybody across the spectrum can recognize that gender dysphoria is a pretty major thing that young people would be undergoing if they're questioning their gender. I do think in that situation, you do need to let parents know. I don't think you need to be hiding something. If it's something that is uh, so, you know, if, if it's something that's so monumentous that it might require medical intervention, you should be telling parents about these things. Uh, and I say this as somebody, you know, who recognizes there's also gonna be situations that when parents are told there's gonna be negative outcomes there. This is why we also have to have, you know, uh, be respecting uh, young people's autonomy, their civil rights and their right to not be abused or attacked. Uh, there's legal mechanisms for that. But by and large, we have to be trusting that parents are going to be there for their kids. Did you ever think, you know, when you were started running for uh, the libertarian presidential nomination or, uh, you know, you were uh, you had a very high profile run uh, for the Senate in Georgia a couple of years ago? That was, you know, that that forced something into a runoff. Did you ever think that the libertarian party would ultimately come up one part, one issue party and it would have something to do with, you know, trans transitioning for underage kids? Yeah, it seems to me that that's odd that this has become a wedge issue in the party, considering how few people it actually intersects with. Like this is, you know, a fraction of a fraction of a population. Uh, and there are so many other areas along the libertarian spectrum where there's broad agreement on things like being anti-war, criminal justice reform, reforming the problems with immigration, uh, getting taxation out of our lives, ending the Fed. There are so many areas where there's broad agreement. And I think, you know, seeing a wedge politic kind of wedge into our party. It's much of what we've seen throughout our history in terms of politics. You know, I'm old enough to still remember 2004 when gay marriage was used as the wedge politic for that election. It drew out voters. Um, and, and to me, I wish the party were working. It's worth pointing out in 2004, no major politician was, uh, was in favor of gay marriage, right? Other, Other than, than libertarian parties. Yeah. So what do you think is going on? Like what what happened within the Libertarian Party that seizing on this issue, you know, because the trans issue seemed, seems to motivate a lot of the anger against you uh, or frustration with you at the various highest levels, as well as, you know, Twitter is not reality, thank God. But, you know, it, it seems to, you know, how how did that move front and center into a party where, you know, they want to get rid of the Fed or, you know, you want to get rid of the Fed. You want to legalize Bitcoin. You want to do all sorts of things. And yet this is the hang up issue. 
Yeah, I think part of that is, is again, just like we saw with immigration, where I said, you know, people have ginned up fear about immigration and this migrant crime wave that doesn't really exist. I think that's much been, uh, that's also been happening in terms of social policy. This has been the the latest craze because back in 2004, gay marriage was used as a wedge. Well, now everybody knows a gay person. Everybody knows a gay couple. That's not a thing that scares people anymore. But the trans community is a far smaller subsect of the greater LGBTQ community. And so it's far easier to target them and to draw them out and to try to create distinction. And so I think that's what we've seen from those who want to drive a social wedge in our politics. And many have bought into that. Like I I'm somebody who is broadly speaking, just very socially permissive. And I think that's been the libertarian kind of MO for a long time. Uh, but I also think part of this is, hey, I'm also, in addition to being the first millennial candidate for president, I'm also the first LGBTQ candidate that has existed on nearly every ballot across the country. Right. Openly, I, I think openly LGBTQ. Openly, yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah, we're not talking about James Buchanan or anything, but, uh, you know, but the openly. And, and I think that is also going to draw many of those questions to me just naturally. Um, I imagine, you know, Barack Obama got a lot of questions about race relations, for instance, when he was running as the first major African-American candidate on a ticket. So uh, I, I imagine that's probably why I get some of these questions and why some of these divisions exist. Also, it, we had a very hard fought primary. And a lot of people try to use that as a distinguishing policy. And they've continued to do that post uh, nomination, which, you know, I think is to the detriment of our party. Yeah, are you disappointed that there seems to be a fair amount, uh, forget about the trans issue, but just kind of open homophobia within Libertarian Party ranks? Or have you experienced that? Um, you know, not many more than I have in like the general public. There have always been times when I've uncovered homophobia, both, you know, just people trying to be jerks online or being critical. Mm -hmm. But of course, there are people who just have legitimate, like, real, they have just not experienced being around gay people and they're just, they're socially conditioned to feel, you know, however they feel. Um, all I can do is continue to be somebody who's going to be out there being, you know, uh, as, as friendly to people as possible, always extending my hand, trying to break the notion that we're somehow something to be afraid of or that we're going to lead to the downfall of society. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've experienced homophobia in pretty much every political circle I've run in. It's uncomfortable everywhere where it occurs. And frankly, it reduces your argument. Like if you come to me with just rank homophobia, I'm just less likely to even want to engage or really have any kind of intellectual discussion because you're starting on a place that is just, you know, frankly hateful. Yeah. Um, the Libertarian Party, the National Party, has entered into a fundraising agreement with Robert F. Kennedy Jr., the independent candidate, who in a tweet, and, you know, the LP isn't responsible for this, but he talked about the Libertarian Party or the LNC as being nonpartisan. This does seem to be odd. The head of the Libertarian Party, Angela McArdle, has openly talked about how the strategy of the LP in this election is to, you know, get rid of Biden, to make sure that Biden doesn't win so that Trump wins. And I assume that'll be updated to, uh, you know, uh, to talk about Kamala Harris. Um, how do you feel about that fundraising um, agreement and the idea that the LP is not even explicitly pushing you as the candidate, you know, as to get on the stage and to win the debates or win the uh, the election? Yeah, of course, I would much rather the LNC be joining my campaign to try to raise money for the libertarian candidate and libertarian campaign. Uh, so I'm kind of a, just based, you know, against uh, my party fundraising for one of my opponents. Uh, and I completely separate myself from that. I'm staying completely out of that whole discussion because, frankly, I don't want to get involved in tying myself into that knot. Uh, but with regards to, you know, the idea that we're in it just to beat Biden or beat the Democrats, uh, I'm in it to beat down both of the terrible, the terrible ideas in both major parties. I think there are bad ideas in the Republican party that deserve to be called out. There's bad ideas in the Democratic party that deserve to be called out. And there deserves to be a choice for voters that is outside of the two party system, whether that's me or RFK or anybody else, we should have more choices on our ballots. And, you know, that's the thing that I'm supporting is a notion that you don't have to be limited to those two choices. And I'm running to build the foundation of Libertarian Party. I'm not running just to deny one or the other the White House. I, frankly, would like to deny both Harris and Trump the White House if I could, you know, God willing. Uh, and, you know, that's and, and I would like to inhabit the White House to be able to, you know, start a very libertarian revolution in 2025. But uh, do you have a that, message for the members of the Mises caucus or the uh, LP National Committee? 
um, that might get them to be like, well, what are we thinking? We should be supporting Chase Oliver for president. All I can say is that I've been consistently libertarian in my philosophy, in my practice. I've been somebody who's worked for, to the betterment of the Libertarian Party for the last 10 years since I've been a party member. I've served on my state's executive committee. I've served on the boards for uh, libertarian nonprofits that have sought to spread the libertarian message to communities that aren't hearing it. I've served as the chair of a local affiliate, and I've helped raise thousands of dollars to, to feed the homeless in Atlanta using the Libertarian Party of Atlanta as the mechanism to do that, which was a great practice to do. I've uh, fought for, you know, I've participated in conventions. I've been involved in the party structurally for a long time. I'm somebody who's invested in this party because I know this is the best vehicle for success. And I hope that those who are listening to this, who maybe have hurt feelings from convention or have differences of opinion with me on some policies can recognize mm -hmm. that on the whole, our platform and our prescription is the most libertarian, is the most bold in terms of the direction of freedom. And it's the one we should be supporting. We should be coming together. And frankly, I would be coming together for whomever the nominee was if it wasn't me, because I care about the Libertarian Party, in particular in my state of Georgia, where ballot access is dependent upon the success of this ticket. And we need to be supporting the success of this ticket everywhere, in every state as much as possible to grow our party, to grow our message, because this is not just about Chase Oliver in 2024. This is about the Libertarian Party going forward from here. How can we grow into the next generation? And for those who maybe uh, you know have skepticism about being LGBTQ or those attitudes, I welcome the conversation one-on-one -on -one with me. Let's have a conversation. Let's talk. I've done this many times, but I want to encourage them to recognize that the next generation Gen Z, 30% of that generation identifies as LGBTQ. And 90% of that generation is broadly supportive of people being allowed to be who they want to be. And so if we want to grow and survive with the times, we need to recognize this. What do you, uh, before I want to go to some biographical information, but when you say, you know, 30% of Gen Z says that they are LGBTQ uh, plus, actually, what does that possibly mean? I mean, is what is going on um, in kind of sexual identification that, uh, you know, you would have fairly narrow bands of people saying, you know, they're uh, lesbian or gay or bi to suddenly, you know, uh, almost it seems like a plurality of uh, of Gen Z. Is that does that reflect actual sexual desire or is something else going on there? I think what that reflects is people are more comfortable in their own skin because the largest growth group of that is bisexuality, is people who identify as uh, being attracted to both sexes, which I think, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, somebody might have just said, well, I'm straight just because it's easier and it's, you know, much easier to blend into the greater society. But as people have been more comfortable in themselves, they're more comfortable identifying as who they actually are. This isn't some sort of like the, the chemicals in the water aren't turning people gay or anything. Right. It's, the, it's more of that people are comfortable culturally in their own it, skin. And it's not that people are trying to get clout or be cool because it's like suddenly, you know, being even being, you know, merely homosexual or merely lesbian, just, eh, you know, in a, in a world of rapidly proliferating identity politics, that's that just doesn't get you uh, very far. I don't, th I don't think the statistics bear that out considering the largest uh, group and even among those Gen Zers are the L, the G and the B part of that. Uh, mm -hmm. And so for me, you know, I think it's just a better kids, you know, young people are more comfortable in their own skin. And I'll use an example. I have a nephew who's in his early 20s and he came out as bisexual and he, you know, he expressed that. And he said one of the reasons was as that he saw people being comfortable in their own skin. So he felt like he could be comfortable in his own skin. I think that's a good thing for people to be able to express themselves as they see fit. Uh, and, and for me, that's what is really driving this. It's not, you know, uh, and, and we can talk about all sorts of other things, but for me, that's what I think we're seeing here. And that's why we need to be broadly more permissive to let people just live who they want to be, man. Like, be who you want to be. Like, that's really what the libertarian mantra should be. Keep the government out of it. Keep force out of it. Keep violence out of it. And let's just, like, live free with each other. And if you want to live a more traditional life, do that. If you want to live uh, outside of the box, hey, do that. Just don't hurt me and don't steal my stuff when you try to do it. Let's talk a little bit about you. You said, you know, you got involved with the LP about a decade ago. Before that, you were uh, on the left side of the political spectrum uh, and you were primarily uh, you got in, activated into politics because of anti-war stuff. Can you talk a bit about how you became interested in politics and how that ended up uh, at the libertarian end of things? Yeah. So um, my parents can tell you that I've always been really kind of a political junkie, even when I was little. Like I always liked to watch speeches and things like that. Like I always enjoyed watching election night coverage. 
but what really got me involved as an activist in politics was 9-11 had happened and I saw the war starting. And really what really ignited me, I mean, I was already skeptical when we started the war in Afghanistan, but what really ignited my skepticism in becoming an anti-war activist was the war in Iraq that was churning up and seeing that the CIA was manipulating and cherry picking intelligence to create this case for a war that just really wasn't realistic or there. Uh, there was no there there. Uh, and that outraged me. And that got me involved because I saw so many people in my generation going to go fight and possibly die in a war, and thousands did, uh, that should have never been fought in the first place. Uh, and because George Bush was the Republican per, you know, prosecuting that war, uh, I just kind of reflexively, because like many voters, they only think there's really two choices. I just kind of fell in line with Democrats. And even though I, you know, there, there have always been things like orthodoxies that Democrats have not liked about me. Like I've always liked guns. Uh, I've always hated taxes and been kind of a free market guy. Uh, but because they were anti-war, uh, because they were pro-LGBT, I was like, okay, this is where I belong. And uh, and then in the primary in 2008, we had Hillary Clinton, who was like Dick Cheney in a pantsuit. And we had Barack Obama, who was saying all this stuff about ending wars and closing Guantanamo. And, oh, I'm going to meet with the leaders of Iran without precondition. And that sounded very attractive to the anti-war movement. And so a lot of us fought really hard to help him win that primary and, and eventually help him win that election. And then he did none of it and and then got a Nobel Peace Prize for doing none of it. And right. that outraged me and it pushed me out. And I kind of started identifying in about 2010 as an independent, you know, squishy Democrat voting independent at the time. Uh, and I was at the Liber or I was at the uh, Pride Festival in Atlanta in 2010. And that's where I met the Libertarian Party of Georgia. That's where I first got introduced to the Libertarian Party. And they were like, no, we're the real anti-war party. These are the people you need to roll with because our anti-war position is principled in the ideas of non-aggression. Uh, and also, by the way, if you haven't noticed, we're here because we think you should be able to love who you want to love. And that mm -hmm. earned that candidate for Governor John Mons, my first libertarian vote. And I have voted libertarian in every major election since. Uh, mm -hmm. But it wasn't until 2014 I fully made the jump and started paying the dues and becoming a libertarian party member. Can you uh, outline outline your preferred foreign policy? Uh, my preferred foreign policy is one that we are exporting our values via voluntary trade and exchange and not using militarism. And so I would seek to basically close overseas bases, remove our military footprint uh, and bring our military back in line with its true mission, which would be defending ourselves from invasion, not exporting and going into war all over the world. Should there be uh, should we be um, should we have military allies that we pledge to support if invaded? Uh, we can have allies that we shouldn't be entangled into supporting them, but we can broadly have market relationships and allyships and friendships with nations all over the world. Uh, but we should not be contingent of if you are attacked, we must defend uh, because there can be situations where, um, you know, uh, contingencies where that shouldn't be the case. I prefer to keep ourselves free from foreign entanglements as our first president kind of highlighted the need to do. Mm. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't rise to the need of our friends, just like we did in World War II. Uh, when we were attacked, we immediately joined in the fight. Uh, we allied with nations that were uh, on our side of the conflict. Should we be, uh, should we be funding uh, Ukraine and sending them weapons? Uh, no, our government shouldn't be in the policy of funding the fight against Ukraine. I think, frankly, right now, we've already sent hundreds of billions at this point. But uh, I think Europe, mainland Europe, should be leading that fight. If they're going to militarily engage, they're the ones who are most directly threatened. Uh, if I were president, my policy would be allowing refugees to become the United States who are in the middle of the firefight so that way we can get innocent people out of the war zone, as well as providing amnesty for any person who's conscripted to fight in a war they don't want to fight in, which is what most of the Russian military is at this point. Uh, let these people go AWOL because conscription is slavery. You shouldn't be forced to fight in a war. And I can think of no better use of amnesty than allowing those who've been politically forced to fight in a war to no longer have to do so. I've seen you quoted as saying that what Israel is doing in Gaza is genocide. Is that an accurate description of your view of uh, Israel's uh, war actions in Gaza? I think when you look at the definitions that are brought forward by the International Criminal Court, I think much of uh, the standards there have been met by the uh, the practices of the Israeli government. Uh, and I think that's to the detriment of the Israeli people who would like to see a more peaceful and stable Israel, who would like to see a more peaceful and stable region. And so, yes, uh, I, I think what we have seen from Netanyahu and his government and his war cabinet can rise to that occasion, certainly. Does Israel have a right to exist? 
Yes, I think they do. I think, frankly, right now, those populations are going to have to figure out a way to either coexist in one state or exist within two states that are neighboring each other. Uh, there's no way to, you know, uh, put the genie back in the bottle, so to speak. So um, for me, yes, the people of Israel have a right to exist. Everyone has a right to exist, frankly, whether you're under an eight, one nation or another. But the people of Israel have a right to exist, but so do the people of Palestine. And whether that's existing under one state or two, uh, they need to figure out, not the United States, but yes. Should we be, you know, how, how might the United States, which obviously was deeply involved, has been deeply involved in the Middle East for, you know, decades now, and until relatively recently had, you know, a major present military presence in Iraq, and we still have troops stationed all over the place. Um, should that all disappear? And should we not do anything? Or should we be, how, how, how might we broker uh, you know, peace in the Middle East? Or is that really not for us to be doing? Frankly, yes, we need to be removing our military footprint uh, as quickly and orderly as possible so that it can be done in a way that's responsible, not like what we saw with the Afghanistan withdrawal, which was kind of haphazardly done. We need to be better planning that, but we do need to be planning to withdraw ourselves completely from the Middle East. Uh, and um, I think the best thing we can do is be a neutral arbiter. If someone wants a place, a, a love, you know, a neutral playing ground, a Camp David or something like that to speak at and to summit at, we can act as that neutral person. But what we should not be doing is putting our thumb on the scale. Uh, and I think that's what we've been doing over the last you know, few decades. And it's not led to better outcomes. In fact, it's led to more turmoil and more tension in the region. And so we need to take ourselves off. We need to take ourselves off of adding pressure to that situation and insisting that the governments and the people that they are supposed to be representing, really, frankly, the people need to be rising up and demanding peace and insisting that their governments act in accordance with the will of their people. Do you worry about, um, you know, uh, Islamic uh, extremism as a uh, threat either to the U.S.? Um, or to the uh, kind of peace in the world? Um, or is that something that has been overblown? Oh, I feel like the, the, you know, the, the threat of it being in the United States is a little bit overblown. That's not to say that there aren't bad people who want to try to do bad things in the United States, but I think we certainly have the capability. Uh, and you know, we can certainly do this without violating people's due process the way that we have the last 20 years, but we have the capability of keeping our nation uh, safe from those kinds of things in a way that's also in accordance with the Constitution and the rule of law. Uh, but I do think that the threat has been somewhat overblown, just like I think many of the threats uh, have been overblown because the military industrial complex likes to overblow these threats because they like to make people afraid. Because when you're afraid, you justify Congress spending billions and billions and trillions of dollars on weapon systems and all sorts of things that that pad the pockets of the military industrial complex. There is a lobby for fear in this country. There is a lobby to make us afraid. For instance, China. China is the biggest thing that they try to make us afraid of these days. They say, they're buying all the farmland. They're going to take away our food security. That's not true at all. First off, only 3% of American farmland is owned by anyone outside the United States. China is the 10th nation on that list at less than 1%. So they're at less than 1% of 3%. They're not violating- Who, are, who is the big, uh, who are the big foreign countries that have bought up uh, 3% of our farmland? Uh, Canada is the largest one, obviously, being right next uh, to us. But like the, the Dutch, I think course. the Dutch have seven times as much farmland as China does. But we don't fear invasion from the Dutch or that how, the Netherlands are going to affect our food security. It's all military how, industrial uh, complex scare tactics. Yeah. How do you, um, you know, what? How should the United States, or is this part of the problem? Is that we're thinking about how should the United States deal with China? We should be thinking about it on a more individual level, but. You know, China, um, do, do China's national interests conflict with a flourishing United States? Well, you know, I think they're definitely an economic adversary in the world in terms of the fact that they are trying to manipulate currency and do other things to give themselves a larger, you know, stake in terms of the economy. But I think what we need to do is actually instead of raising up protectionist terrier, tariff barriers that make things more expensive for consumers here in the United States. We need to be calling China's bluff and continuing to engage in as much foreign trade with them as possible, because what you're doing when you do that is you're inflating that balloon. You're making them inflate that currency manipulation balloon until eventually it will burst. Mm -hmm. Once it does, there's going to be a major recession in China, and the people of China will be hopefully requesting more market liberalism and, and less protectionism from what they've had. Uh, and, and that's the way we can actually compete with them, is not to try to put up trade barriers, but to actually continue trading and let them continue to try to keep up. Because that's what they're doing right now, is just trying to keep up. Uh, and the CCP will eventually fall behind on that, the, and uh, it will be to their own doing. It's like the you know the guy who puts the stick in the bike meme. That's what China's mm -hmm. about to do themselves. They're about to shove that stick in the front tire and flip face forward. 
because they've been doing this, you know, uh, kind of market practice for years. And I assume that, you know, going back to immigration, that if we allow kind of the best and the brightest of China or of other countries to come here more easily, that just expedites the process. Oh, yeah. If China goes into a major recession, you're going to see a lot of brain drain coming out of that nation and towards the United States. So uh, certainly, I think in those conditions, we would, you know, we would be to the benefit. Uh, and I think we are to the benefit right now if we ease immigration to be allowing the best and the brightest to come here, to frankly go to school here and then stay here uh, after they've gone to school, uh, because, you know, uh, there's this great value in doing that and having open immigration. Do you um, do you think that either uh, Harris or Trump will adopt various uh, libertarian party planks or you know things that you're talking about, policies that you're talking about in order to secure victory? I mean, by virtually every account, this is going to be close. The 2020 election in the Electoral College was decided by 40,000 votes spread across three states, the one in 2016 and by about 80,000 votes in three states as well. Um, you know, is that a, um, you know, is that something to look forward to in terms of affecting maybe not the, the fortunes of the Libertarian Party, but policy that affects all Americans? Well, I think if Donald Trump or Kamala Harris were intelligent, they would. They would find libertarian policy that they could put forward to try to draw votes. And I think they're going to probably try to do that because you're right, this is going to be a close election. Um, but I think that's actually one way we actually maintain victory as libertarians. You know, Outside of outright winning the election, there are other metrics to victory that we can have. One of those is, do the major parties adopt our ideas in order to stop the bleed of their voters? Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. In fact, that's one of the reasons why I encourage people who are frustrated with the system to vote outside of it, because it's going to have them be more responsive more quickly to the needs and to the will of what you want, as opposed to just kind of placating or trying to change the system from within. Uh, but that's a real metric of victory that we can look to. So outside of winning, if we get libertarian policy adopted because they want our votes, and this would even be better under a ranked choice voting model. Like if we had ranked choice voting, that would happen even more organically because they would be coming to people saying, I know you're going to vote the libertarians in your first round vote. Here's why you need to make us your second round vote. And that would actually create more civility across the party spectrum. So yes. I think that's actually a win. If they adopt policy once they get elected because they say, hey, we need to make sure we don't lose libertarian votes in the future, that's a good thing. And that's the pressure we put on them when you vote libertarian in 2024. Do you think uh, Donald Trump at the uh, libertarian convention said that he would fr he would commute Ross Ulbricht, the founder of the Silk Road uh, website, uh, that he would commute his sentence uh, upon gaining office for the second time? Um, you know, and that he would also uh, appoint a libertarian to a cabinet position. Do you uh, do you believe him? You know, it's hard to trust Donald Trump. It really is just based on his record, the things he said in the past, things like I'll cut the debt and deficit in half in eight years, which he never did. You know, he's made, he's failed a lot of promises. Um, I would like to see him if he were elected commute Ross Ulbricht's sentence. Frankly, if I were president, I would give him a full pardon. Uh, I you know, uh, and, and I think that would be more in line. But if he's going to commute a sentence, that's good. It would be good to see Ross free. Do I trust that he's going to do that? Not really, because it's hard for me to trust anything he says. As regards to putting a libertarian in the cabinet, I think that libertarian is going to look more like Republican Senator Mike Lee than, say, a Spike Cohen or a Chase Oliver or a Dave Smith. You know, he's going to pick a small L libertarian Republican and say, that's my libertarian that I put in there. And if you want to find evidence of that, you know, when he came to speak at our convention, he quoted the great libertarian writer, whatever his name was. And the only thing that guy's ever written about the Libertarian Party is that libertarian should drop out and endorse Donald Trump. And so Donald Trump doesn't really know what a libertarian is. Uh, and I think he'll quickly fall right in line to, oh, a liberty Republican is libertarian enough for my cabinet. I don't think that's enough to sell your vote. Do you think Kamala Harris might adopt any libertarian-ish planks? You know, it's hard for me to think of one off the bat because just her kind of policy style is to always use more government instead of less government. Uh, possibly, you know, with uh, things like, you know, um, you might see some ease of restriction on immigration from her, but I don't think she's going to fix the problem as we've seen with her <laughs> being in charge of the issue for the Biden administration yeah. has been very effective. Just uh, so don't no, I, I don't see a lot of libertarian out of her. She was not the border czar, right? She was merely in charge of Biden policy, but not the czar, right? Oh, uh, it's not the czar, but but the the queen. Can we call her the border queen? Yeah. No, Arena, uh, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, the border empress. We'll find some. Uh, we'll find some title for her. Uh, but you know, broadly speaking, I don't think much of the Democratic portfolio 
uh, is super libertarian right now. So I'm not anticipating a lot of that. Frankly, none of the Republican portfolio is very libertarian either, uh, other than, you know, uh, the same lip service they talk about cutting government spending and cutting the size of government. But, you know, I'll believe that when I see it. Uh, Chase Oliver, I want to thank you for talking to Reason. This has been uh, elucidating and enlightening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me.